of our member hangouts, especially for members. We talked to you back in March when we were discussing what you could expect when we reopened the giant ocean tank. Now we're going to have the opportunity to show you some of those things that we were talking about before. I'll introduce our guest to you in just one second, but first I want to show you a little something that I have here. So this is a piece of the coral sculpture. Let's see if I can get it without any reflection that was removed from the giant ocean tank last year when we started construction. This was uh, has most likely been there since 1985, the last big renovation. And this could be yours, but to win it, you're going to need to stick around with us. We'll tell you a little bit more about this as we get to the end of our hangout. I do want to introduce you to our guests. Billy Spitzer is the Vice President of Programs, Exhibits, and Planning for the New England Aquarium. Hey, Billy, how are you doing today? Good, doing great. Good. Hi, everybody. And in our other window there, we have Chris Barnfind, who is a senior aquarist and one of the guys who's probably waving at you from the other side of the glass when you when you visit the aquarium. Uh, Chris is one of our divers as well. So, Chris, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks. So, before we get into things, I do want to let members know, if you look down at the bottom of the screen that you're watching here, there's information about how you can ask questions. We will be answering your questions a little bit later on in this webcast. You can click the form to fill in, and that will send an email to us, which we will take a look at, and maybe we'll answer your question. You can also send your question live as a tweet. Just use the hashtag AskNEAQ, like New England Aquarium, Ask. N E A Q. We will be looking at those questions as they come in, and we'll ask some to the guys a little bit later on. So before we start, let's um, take a look at all of this construction. We we videotaped the entire project, but we're going to condense it for you a little bit. This is uh, 10 months in about 60 seconds. So this is what it looked like from the top of the giant ocean tank. It was a bit surreal when we were up there. I love the part where it fills up. So that is the giant ocean tank then and now. And we'll take a closer look at what the giant ocean tank looks like right now. So for those of you who may be members of the New England Aquarium but are not right here in New England and have not had a chance to visit since we reopened the GOT at the beginning of July, we hope to show you some of the things that you will see when you next come to visit. For those of you who have visited, and we know that there are a lot of you that are regular visitors here to the aquarium, we're going to show you some things that you may not have noticed, a little bit of a behind-the-scenes look at the aquarium. And I think we're going to start right here with this video that's rolling right now. This is the Blue Planet Action Center. Billy, can you tell us a little bit about, a little bit about the BPAC, as we call it? Sure. Uh, well, when we were thinking about um, kind of re- reinventing the aquarium experience, one of the things we realized is that um, we need to help visitors understand kind of right at the beginning of their uh, journey through the aquarium um, how the aquarium is really connected to what's happening out in the ocean. And the Blue Planet Action Center um, is really a place where you can learn about um, what are some of the issues going on in the ocean, um, how do they relate to the animals um, that you'll see um, at the aquarium. Um, what are some of the things that the aquarium is involved in, research that we're doing out in the field and so on, and uh, kind of how, how can you get involved um, in helping to uh, protect the ocean? And we try to do that in a bunch of ways. Right now you're looking at um, what, what I kind of call uh, our big iPads. They're these um, large touch screens that allow you to um, explore these floating bubbles into which focuses on a particular animal. Um, learn some cool things about that animal, um, but also learn about what's happening to the, ma the mountain, the ocean, and um, what we're doing uh, to help them out and what you can do to, uh, to help them out as well. Um, we also have uh, in, that, in, the, in the BPAC space um, 
a really great area for presentations by educators with live animals, with activities that help people understand their ecological footprint and uh, data around the globe in terms of uh, changes like overfishing and climate change. Uh, and we also have some live animal exhibits that focus um, on uh, a couple of key animals, uh, which I think we'll see in a couple minutes in the video um, as well. And, and let's hold off on, on this um, special animal exhibit that's down in the bee pack. This, for the most part, is an area that is um, not an animal exhibit. We have a lot of information there. We share with people, uh, as you said, how the aquarium connects to the oceans and the outside world. Can you give us a little bit more background on that? Sure. Well, um, you know, one of the things that we know is people come to the aquarium because they're interested in, in marine life and, and learning about it. Um, but what we can do in the BPAC is help people make that kind of direct connection from, um, you know, I'm interested in fur seals to what's happening with fur seals uh, out in the wild, not just at the aquarium. Um, we can also bring in, uh, you just saw a second ago, um, some video that we have that was actually taken quite recently from some of our aquarists and researchers who were down in Belize studying coral reefs. Um, and so you can kind of get up to date on what's happening uh, kind of right now in terms of current research. Um, so it's really a way to help people connect and see the bigger story um, behind uh, behind all the other exhibits and tanks and so on. And we should mention that these, um, the work that the aquarium does outside of our building here on Central Wharf, this isn't new. We've just finally found a way to share it with people, uh, to show them some of the other things that are going on um, that the aquarium does. Yeah, that's right. And there's a lot of that, a lot of that work represented now uh, on our blogs and on our website. And really in the BPAC, we're trying to find ways to bring it into uh, the visitor experience and really help people uh, kind of understand that um, and kind of use what they're seeing in the bee pack as a way to then explore throughout the rest of their uh, rest of their experience. And as you said, we do have a couple of animal exhibits that are attached to the bee pack, and they're um, they're unique exhibits. Uh, why don't you explain a little bit about what we sure. have? Sure. So we decided we'd focus on uh, two animals um, that both have really interesting uh, life cycles. One is um, on lobsters um, at the lobster nursery, um, and we show um, lobsters that are uh, growing up at different stages. These come from our research lab upstairs, where we have one of the only uh, lobster uh, research hatcheries. Um, we study things like shell disease in lobsters um, and influence of uh, climate change on lobsters. But here's a great opportunity to see uh, lobsters before the seven-year-old ones that you see on your dinner plate. You know, these are the little tiny ones. Um, we have different kinds of lobsters, different colors, and so on that you can see as well. And the idea is to really help people understand um, you know, these animals, they don't just appear one day, uh, you know, on your dinner plate. They go through a life cycle. Um, they depend on uh, habitats as they grow up to uh, survive. Um, and lobsters are actually a great example of a pretty well-sustained and sustainable fishery. So it's actually a really pretty good news story uh, in a way. But we want people to understand, um, you know, how cool these animals are, but also they're part of the bigger system and part of a life cycle. And um, this... And this, it, it's hard to tell looking at the pictures, but we do, um, these lobsters are very, very small, but they're still not the smallest lobsters we have in this building. Yeah, that's right. We have some that are in their, in their planktonic stage that, um, you know, are, are floating around there, you know, just big enough for the eye, uh, eye to see. Um, the ones we have in here are, are a few months old. Um, now we're looking at uh, the other side, our shark nursery, um, and looking at one of the uh, egg cases that we have. Oh, now we're back to lobsters. Um, uh, in, in the shark nursery, um, the idea there is, is, again, looking at the life cycle. And one of the things about sharks is that um, uh, many of the species um, either give live birth or, or give birth um, to, uh, you know, already, you know, almost ready to swim uh, young in these, in these kind of uh, egg sacs. And, um, they're really vulnerable um, in terms of their reproductive strategy. And it's not like they're producing millions of eggs. Um, so part of the goal behind this exhibit is to let people see these little embryonic sharks as they develop and some of the juvenile ones and understand that, you know, we think of sharks as big, scary things, 
Um, when you see them in this exhibit, you realize they're actually pretty small, cute, and vulnerable. So that's that's a different way to look at sharks. And we should add, we, we will see some pictures of sharks and rays um, as part of this video that's showing right now. But it, again, it's hard to tell without seeing it. But these are sharks that, that could fit in my hand that we're looking at. Uh, obviously, with the egg cases, they're even smaller than that. But the sharks that we will see in the video, like that little ray there, um, could fit in the palm of my hand. And I like, you and I, Billy, um, talked about this last week. I like the fact that we now see the entire cycle for sharks and rays. That's so right. They start out in this nursery. What will happen when they get too big for the nursery? Well, yeah, we kind of have the whole life cycle going on in our shark ray touch tank. Um, we have sharks that are uh, giving birth and reproducing. Those babies make their way into this exhibit. When the babies grow up uh, to be big enough, they'll go back in the shark and ray touch tank. When they get too big for the shark and ray touch tank, many of them will go in our giant ocean tank uh, or, or, in some cases, to other, other aquariums. So um, it's kind of a sustainable process, we hope, so we don't have to go out and collect, some, collect them from the wild. And this is an exhibit. It is um, a little bit dark down there because it needs to be a little bit dark down there. Um, but it, it is um, right after the bee pack for those of you who may be coming to the aquarium and wondering where you will find that. You know, let's go right from the, the lower level of the aquarium where you first enter. Let's go all the way up to the top to level four and we'll start talking about the giant ocean tank. And um, we do want to let people know the top of the giant ocean tank, which we for years have just referred to as the top of the giant ocean tank, has an official name now. It is the Gaki Coral Reef Center. If you're from the Boston area, you certainly recognize the Yaki name, and we thank the Yaki Foundations for their help in making all of this possible. It is um, very, very different from what we used to have there. The video you're looking at right now is the ceiling, um, and the lighting is a little bit different, Billy. Can you touch on, on um, it's not just the type of lighting that you throw the switch on or off, is it? Sure. Well, so now all our lights uh, are LED lights, which is, which is great um, for a number of reasons. They're more energy efficient. Um, they produce less heat, so we don't have to, uh, we're not dumping as much heat into the exhibit. Um, and what's really amazing is that not only is each of these light fixtures that you see controllable, but within each light fixture, there are, I don't know, maybe 100 different LED elements. Each one of those is individually programmable. So we can tune the uh, color, hue, brightness um, of each of, these, each of these lights. And one of the effects we were able to create is about every half an hour during the day, it looks as if clouds are passing over uh, the exhibit, just like they would be. And so you see kind of the shadow moving across the exhibit, which is created by uh, controlling all those individual lights. Um, these lights also enable us to do a lot more in terms of um, gradually turning on the lights during the day and gradually turning them off at night, which simulates more of what uh, these animals would see in the wild. And one thing we have, which is great for evenings, uh, for evening events, you know, member events and so on, is that we have this great kind of twilight lighting setting now where it's great for the animals because they're able to experience that lower light as kind of moving toward sleepy time, toward darkness, but great for people who are in the building because you can really see what's going on. It almost looks like kind of moonlight. Um, and if, if you are in the building before we open at 9 o'clock, you would see a simulated sunrise. The lights come exactly. up very gradually in the morning, and they go down at night. Um, what else do we have that's that's new at the top of the GOT? Let's talk about the, the viewing platform itself, how many more... Uh, or how much easier it is to see the top of the GOT. One of the things that we did, which is really helpful, is the um, the rail around the top of the tank is now all um, all all glass, so you can uh, see through. You know, everywhere it's great for little kids. Um, it really 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 enables the whole um, top of the tank to have a much more open feel. Um, also, in addition to the um, platform we've had for many years for divers, which we've rebuilt, we added another platform, which is for, um, for educators and presentations uh, and program activities. So um, it used to be that you know, you'd hear an educator talking at the top of the tank, and you couldn't really figure out, you know, where are they? What are they talking <laughs> about? Now you can really see them. Um, and um, uh, I, I, can go, I can go into more about you know, kind of how we're able to really show people what's in the tank. Um, in that we now, not only can the educators talk about what's going on, but um, on these screens you see um, up at the top, there's, you see one, you see the, the second one. Um, what they're able to do is actually project what's happening in the tank. Um, divers now um, can go in the tank with a video camera and they can show exactly what they're seeing um, right up close. Um, 
and also talk to the educators and, and communicate with visitors about what's happening. So there's a much better opportunity to not only you know kind of point out what you see from the top, what's happening at the surface, but what's happening underneath uh, as well. And I think that's a great point to bring Chris into the conversation. Chris, you yesterday were kind enough to actually dive with that camera so that we could videotape some of this and share it with our uh, our members today. Yeah, and actually I did it this morning as well. Uh, we, we do it every single day. Uh, we have a scheduled time. Uh, it's at 2.30. Uh, we can also do it at other times of the day if we have uh, plenty of staff and, uh, and want to do it. So uh, it's, it's really fun. I have never, I've taken a lot of cameras underwater before, but I've never been able to project it onto big screens, you know, right at the, uh, right at the top of the tank for, for the public to enjoy. Yeah, and there's, there's me right there's there. There's some video my, of Chris from yesterday. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's fun. It's also a little challenging. Um, it, it takes a little bit of get, getting used to. You are tethered to an umbilical cord. I, I try to keep it out of the shot. I might have gotten it in a little bit here. Um, and it's about uh, 25 feet long or so, and uh, I'm getting better at it. <laughs> and one of the things I noticed yesterday as you were tugging that umbilical along with you is, um, and it's something we talked about back in March, it used to be that the coral sculpture was this hard sculpture, and Billy, that's not necessarily the case all the time now, is it? We have a lot of soft corals in them. Yeah, that's right. That was one thing that um, we were able to do with the new habitat is um, introduce a lot of the softer coral species, um, and they're made now out of a kind of a flexible, you know, plastic rubber material, which is great. So um, they don't get broken off so easily uh, when divers run into them, or especially when turtles run into them. Um, and one of the good things is that um, they turn out not to taste very good to turtles, which I think will ensure their uh, longevity. Um, <laughs> but they really, they really add a lot. Um, uh, to the whole the whole experience. I mean, the, the reef itself is, is really stunning. It's an incredible uh, work of art as well as an incredible uh, opportunity to communicate some of the some of the biology of reefs. Why don't we talk a little bit more about that? We talked about the the, the reef. We do know, and and visitors have been here to the aquarium since July. We have shared with them that uh, a lot of these. Um, pieces of the coral sculpture were molded from real sculpture molds, uh, uh, real real coral molds, um, so that they they are accurate. But would you say this is the type of reef that people would see if they go down to the Caribbean right now, Billy? Well, we wish. Um, the, in terms of the the kind of diversity and scale of this reef and the um, you know kind of the abundance of coral and fish that you see. This is kind of the Caribbean reef that once was, and we hope the Caribbean reef that you will see in the future. It's not the Caribbean reef of today. Um, you'd be hard pressed to find a reef today that looks quite as vibrant as this one. But um, we've, uh, you know, seen in a lot of the research that we've done out in the field that reefs really can recover, and we're hoping that um, reefs in the Caribbean will be uh, recovering. And um, one thing that is really realistic in this reef is that um, the the different kinds of species you see. Uh, of coral at different depths uh, and the different kinds of fish that hang out at different depths is very representative of what you would see on a real reef. It is compressed vertically. The um, giant ocean tank represents, you know, over 100 feet of reef that's kind of compressed in about, you know, 24 feet. Uh, but um, in terms of the different zones, um, it's a pretty good representation. We've had our, our reef scientists, uh, you know, make sure that we were kind of, you know, keeping keep honest to that. If you're just joining us, you're watching a member hangout here at the New England Aquarium. We're talking with Billy Spitzer, who's the Vice President of Programs, Exhibits, and Planning. Do you have the longest title here at the aquarium, Billy? Oh, uh, it's one of them. And uh, keeps getting added pieces now and then. Chris Barnfind is a senior aquarist, one of our divers here at the New England Aquarium. Chris, yesterday when we videotaped you, it was during one of the, the feeding sessions, and I've noticed that they're a bit different than they used to be. For one thing, we have a lot more fish in there now, don't we? Absolutely, yeah. We have more than twice the amount of fish we, we stocked in there uh, before this renovation. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, a few less of larger fish. Um, so uh, a common question we get is, you know, do the big fish eat the small fish? First answer is no, because we make sure everybody's well fed. But but also now there's there's less chance of that. So uh, we have yeah thousands, a couple thousand fish in there. You wouldn't know it 
because they, they like they're pretty good at hiding. But well, you know, and they're, they're also moving around the tank differently than they used to. And it was explained to me, and gentlemen, please feel free to jump in. We used to have. Um, intakes for the giant ocean tank. For those of you who don't know, we bring water in from Boston Harbor, um, and it actually leaves our tank cleaner than it comes in. But they kind of um, formed a, an artificial current then, didn't they? Um, yeah. So yeah, before we did have all of the uh, the effluents pointing in the same direction, it, it did create a current, and the fish would generally uh, the schooling fish, the the bigger pelagic fish would would tend to go uh, counterclockwise. Um, and now with the new filtration, we actually have uh, six effluents, and there's three going in one direction, three going in the other. And um, I actually uh, wondering if Billy could chime in here and, and answer why we why that why that happened. Well, one of the things we're interested in doing is being able to um, kind of experiment with different kind of current regimes. Um, one thing we thought about is that um, well, it's probably not great to have fish going in the same direction for their entire lives. You know, it's like running around the, the, the track, you know, the high school in the same direction all the time. Good to be able to switch, switch things around. But I think what we found by having these, um, uh, the, you know, the, these, these uh, you know, effluent um, nozzles kind of pointing in the opposite direction is that there's a lot more diversity in the swimming pattern. So it's not like all the fish are going in the same direction. Um, we see some fish, like uh, a lot of the grunts will line up right in front, in front of one of these uh, one of these pipes, and they kind of like to head into the current. But a lot of other schooling fish seem to be moving around, in and out of the reef, back and forth, different directions. And so I think it makes the um, the behavior of the fish a lot more natural and representative of what you would see uh, in the wild, which which is great. But we have the opportunity to kind of experiment over time, uh, you know, with kind of kind of changing direction. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions for Billy and Chris, you can submit them by the form that's right at the bottom of this window here. Or you can also submit them by Twitter. Tweet using the hashtag AskNEAQ. We will share some of those questions with you a little bit later on. Hey, Chris, um, Myrtle, as everybody knows, is the queen of the giant ocean tank. How is she settling in? Does she like her new home? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, she's, uh, she's found a great napping spot that's... Uh, right in front of one of the windows, and she is back to her old self, uh, begging for food, uh, just cruising around the tank. She's, she's a happy girl. She is very comfortable in that one spot now there at the bottom of the tank, too, I noticed. Mm -hmm. We also, um, with adding more fish to the tank, we've increased the challenge that we've always kind of had here at the New England Aquarium. That is, how do people know which fish are which? Now, obviously, we have interpreters, we have educators here who do a great job at sharing information with the visitors. But we've also added some technology. Isn't that right, Billy? Yeah, so, you know, we had this interesting challenge of, you know, 150 or so species. Um, that's a lot of individual labels to produce. How could every, anyone possibly uh, keep track of all those? So um, we decided to do our first um, fish ID app. Um, we work with a local company called FableVision, and we um, designed a very friendly way to uh, kind of sort out what fish you're looking at. Um, you can uh, break it down first um, between uh, sharks, turtles, and fish, and then you know once you want, if you want to look at the more complex category of fish, you can look at thumbnails. Um, then you can also um, narrow it down by uh, choosing um, which shape the fish is, uh, body shape, tail shape. Um, main major colors and color pattern and size. And we tested this out in a paper version um, quite a bit before we developed the software. And um, uh, it really is a pretty neat, pretty neat system. It's pretty easy to use. Um, once we're kind of fully, fully uh, you know, happy and have all the bugs out of it, we're going to be um, releasing it as an iPad app on the App Store. So um, look for that in the future. Um, it's, it's really pretty fun because one thing it does too is that um, as you select a fish um, uh, and, and you know, search for it, it tells you, you know, how many times that's been found. And actually over time, the more popular fish migrate up to the top of the thumbnail list. So um, it makes it easier and easier um, uh, to, find, you know, to find the fish you're looking at. So we started out with a number of these iPads, both at the top of the giant ocean tank and around the giant ocean tank. And when they were installed, they all pretty much work the exact same way. But because people identify fish at different points and fish are common in different areas, they now give you different 
lists of fish as you start identifying them. Yeah, that? they'll pop different ones up to the kind of the top of the list to make it a little easier for you. So one of the things we found that's that's really neat is that uh, uh, because of all the new habitat um, features, particularly a lot of the habitat that's up near the windows, provides a lot of refuge for a lot of the small fish, and so they'll hang out more. So it's not just like in the past, it always felt to me at least like, wow, those fish are swimming by awful fast. What was that? Yes. Now a lot of them will really hang out in one place, and you can really get a good look at them um, and figure out what they are. And one thing I found, for example, is um, I, I, I was looking at a fish, and it had a really distinctive dorsal fin and kind of this black and white pattern. And I thought, oh, yeah, I bet I know what that is. And then it turned out when I did the ID, there were like three or four fish that looked almost exactly like that. And I realized, like, oh, okay. Now I realize there's even more diversity than I thought. Um, you know, and, and, and looking at the, uh, the ID app really helped me kind of narrow down um, what I was looking at, but also realized there were many more things than I thought um, in the tank. It's incredible diversity of species in there. It is, and that was part of the demonstration we just gave with the I identification iPads was, you know, we started just with black and white because that's what you and I had talked about. Right. And then, um, like you said, that dorsal fin, so we chose the shape of the fish, and, and there were five examples right off the top, and very difficult to tell them apart if you're not somebody who works with fish day in and day out. We have a question here. Uh, Andrew from Rainamass would like to know... Um, how do you know when and if all of the fish are fed? Chris, you want to field that one? Oh, definitely. Um, how and when do we know if all the fish have been fed? Well, um, as we talked about earlier, there are a lot of fish in there, you know, a couple thousand. Um, so we obviously can't know for sure if every little fish has eaten, but we do our best. Uh, we do four feeding dives in the giant ocean tank every single day of the year. Uh, including Christmas, Thanksgiving, you know, uh, every day of the year we're feeding. Um, and some of the some of the feeding is targeted towards some of the larger fish, uh, as well as the sea turtles. Um, and we keep really detailed records of, of what they what they're eating, how their appetites are. Uh, the smaller fish, uh, we do our best just to broadcast as much little food around as we can, uh, like zooplankton and krill and uh, chopped up fish and. Uh, yeah, we just do our best, and uh, we seem to be doing an okay job, I think. Yeah, we watched some um, fish attack little shrimp or prawn. I'm not sure what it was that we were, you were feeding them with yesterday. But um, they, they go right after that and, and chomp down on it. So Definitely, they, yeah. And there's, there's some fish in the tank who are a little more shy, who tend to hide, and those are the little fish that we do have to, to target. Um, whereas some of the more aggressive fish, no matter what their size, you know, we just scatter it around and they, they get the food. So when you say target, Chris, does that mean you take special care to go to areas where you know those fish are? Absolutely, yeah. An example of the squirrel fishes, um, they're, they're, they are some that swam right by right there. That was lucky. Um, and uh, they really aren't swimming around like that in that video right there. They tend to kind of hide out underneath some of the plate corals and um, just kind of in the dark shadows, and we definitely target them. That's great. You are watching a live member hangout here at the New England Aquarium. I am talking with Billy Spitzer and Chris Bauernfeind, and uh, we are talking specifically, doing kind of a show and tell of the new, uh, the newly renovated giant ocean tank and giving you some hints. Hey gentlemen, one of the things that I noticed that I don't remember anybody telling us this was going to happen ahead of time, but when we did unveil the GOT, I noticed that you have a lot more, um, that you can see a lot more on the periphery now than we used to be able to because we had this thick, thick glass which held you back, but now we have, um, what are the new windows made out of, Billy? Um, the new windows are, are all acrylic, um, which is great because it's um, optically clear, uh, and we're also we're able to um, make the win windows, uh, uh, you know, at, at kind of a single piece, a little bit thinner than the multi-layered uh, glass we had before. Um, and one of the things we did, which was a, would be a great decision, is that we um, made each uh, each of the windows um, uh, uh, actually lower to the floor by about a foot by by trimming about 12 inches of concrete in front of each window. And what that did is it not only made each window bigger, but enabled us to eliminate um, the footrail and handrail that had been there before. So now you can get right up to each window, which means that um, not only do you get closer, but you actually get a more panoramic view. You can actually see 
from almost any window up to the top of the tank, down to the bottom, all the way around to each side. Um, and again, because it's, there's so much habitat, um, really fish-friendly habitat close to those windows, you see a tremendous amount now from each of those windows, and it's really, really varied. Um, and we, we, did a, we did a lot of work ahead of time in creating a scale model of the tank to try to figure out how to optimize that habitat. But I know I was surprised at how well it came out in terms of, uh, you know, those incredible views um, from, from all these different windows. Yep, and I think a lot of our um, members and visitors will remember the times when you'd be staring at the window, and it was really looking at a picture. You were looking at a section of the giant ocean tank, and only that section. And if a, for example, moray eel swam by, it came as a complete surprise to you when he showed up in your picture. Uh, but now you do see the animals actually swimming around and, and approaching the area where you are standing. We have a question from Twitter. Emily would like to know, what are some of the new fish that we have in the giant ocean tank that have never been displayed at the GOT before? That is a really good question. <laughs> uh, I, have a <laughs> I have a couple of species in mind. Uh, we, we definitely have about 10 to 20 new species in the giant ocean tank that we did before. I think the, mo the most prominent uh, would be our bonnet head shark. Um, and the bonnet head shark looks like a hammerhead, but uh, smaller. Uh, but uh, that would be one. Uh, there's some other little fish you probably wouldn't be able to see unless you were diving in the tank, uh, but some little burr fishes. Um, and a, uh, a checkered puffer also comes to mind. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's some more in there, too. Billy, you got any in your head you can throw out? I guess what really stands out for me is uh, the fact that there are a number of fish where we might have had, you know, one or two before, and now we have entire schools of them. Right. And it's, it, you know, you might, you know, again, you some of these fish you never would have seen before, and now you see a, a ton. And I mean, I, you know, the the grunts are a great example of um, they're really dominant now as as schooling fish. And before, um, I don't know, maybe you'd, you'd see some now and then. Um, and with the expansion of the top of the giant ocean tank also, we have a new exhibit area that's off to the side. There used to be kind of a, a wall that you would see opposite the stairwell for the giant ocean tank. And there are animals in there that are also appropriate for the giant ocean tank. They would live in that type of Caribbean uh, environment. So why are they off by themselves? Why do we put yeah, them that's, over there? That's, that's, uh, that's, that's a great, great point. So we, we realized there are a number of species that um, are great Caribbean uh, you know, reef habitat species, but um, if we put them in the, in the big tank, they would either be uh, hard to see um, or they likely to be, you know, eaten um, by, by other things. Um, so what we did in this, in this uh, um, Yaki Coral Reef Center is created some smaller exhibits that enable us to showcase some of those. And a great example that you're seeing right now are the garden eels, which are um, these um, little um, uh, almost kind of worm-like creatures that um, most of their body is um, underneath, uh, burrowed underneath the sand, and they kind of poke out um, and, uh, and, and kind of wave almost like seagrass, and they're really neat. Um, and they live in, in this kind of um, sandy bottom habitat, but, um, you know, no way could we um, kind of fit them, you know, within a larger tank. Um, got some other species uh, like um, dwarf seahorses and, and some other uh, kind of fish species that, you know, like these that, you know, these are these are little baby versions of some of the bigger fish that you see uh, in the tank, and we're hoping as we're able to um, grow up fish, you'll see some of them appear in these exhibits over time. And that is an exhibit that an exhibit area that will be changing those galleries. Yeah, exactly. They're they're small tanks with you know um, this is the frogfish, which is a, a really really wild looking, <laughs> hard to describe. Only a, a mother only can a mother love. Can love. Kind of fish. Yes. Um, uh, but really, really cool looking. Um, uh, here's a close up of the garden eels. Um, you know, and these and these are you know great species to illustrate that you know a reef is really a community. Um, it's it's like this living city of all these organisms that each have their own little kind of homes. Um, uh, you know, very different niches and habitats, and they all kind of live together in this community. And that's a story we're really trying to help people understand um, through the GOT. We've talked a lot about what people will see if they come to visit the New England Aquarium today. We 
also still have some other things in the works that you will not see yet, but may see in the future. And I think we, we touched a little bit on that, um, talking about Chris diving with the camera on an umbilical, but there's more to this diver communication system that we're working on, isn't there, Chris? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, I don't know if you've been looking over my shoulder here. <laughs> Yeah, that uh, mask is sitting there. Now, that looks different than the mask that I would wear if I go scuba diving. Absolutely, yeah. This is a full face mask. So, basically, your your whole face will be out of the water. Uh, it's, it's actually really cool. Um, and if you don't have a regulator in your mouth and the mask up here, you're able to talk inside your mask. Um, if you're not mic'd up, you can sing to yourself, which I was doing earlier today. Uh, <laughs> Um, but um, one of the things we're going to do is is have audio being projected up to the top of the giant ocean tank, and uh, what that's going to entail is the diving around with the camera, as you guys saw before, and um, talking about what we're seeing. Uh, also, do have scheduled um, educators up there giving talks, and they do take questions from the, uh, the public up at the top of the tank, and so those questions can actually get relayed right through this mask to us, and then we can answer them with our voice. And this is a technology that we are still working on. We want to let folks know that we do. Um, you do dives with the camera on a regular basis, but we're still working. There's, It's not the type of mask that just anybody can put on, is it, Chris? No, it's not. There's uh, some pretty thorough training uh, that you have to go through. In fact, you have to prove to our diving safety officer that you can uh, perform a bailout, which uh, means to flood your mask and and not die. Yeah, John likes doing that anyhow. So. He does. <laughs> we also have a new area at the base of the Iron Ocean Tank that is currently under construction. I understand it will be um, finishing up within the next couple of weeks. Is that right? Yeah, we should have we should have one of the pieces uh, finished up um, hopefully within the week and then um, other pieces coming up um, you know, in the next next couple of weeks after. And what we wanted to do at the bottom of the tank is really help visitors understand that um, coral is actually a living thing um, and when you look at um, you know the kind of pieces of, of, of coral in, in the GOT you know they kind of look like rocks um, you know in a, in a way and what we are doing with these sculptures is we're blowing up um, in, in sculptural form um, corals to you know 200 times life size so you can um, see something that looks like you know is normally the size of a grain of rice uh, coral polyp um, that's you know now the size of your head, um, and uh, you can see all the different parts of the coral, how they eat, um, all the different kinds of things that live in coral and live in sponges, and, and kind of how they how they work, how they operate. So um, it's uh, an exhibit that's designed by the um, same guy Peter Brady who uh, designed the habitat inside the GOT. And one of the reasons why it's taken a little while to complete it is. Uh, the first job he had was to finish the uh, giant ocean tank habitat before we filled up the tank with water, um, and he got that done. And now, you know, we had to give him a little bit of vacation. Now he's now he's finishing these uh, these sculptures. Yeah, it was his first days off in about ten months, right? Something so like that. Yeah, he was yeah, working yeah. pretty pretty hard getting all of that stuff put together. Hey, we have one question from David uh, from Twitter. He wants to know: Will we be adding additional animals to the giant ocean tank? Uh, do you want to, do you want to take that, Chris, or I I could, I guess. Uh, you go ahead. I'll chime in if I think of anything. So, um, so generally, um, our strategy is that we we collect most of our own animals for the giant ocean tank by going on collecting trips down to the Bahamas uh, once or twice a year, and we anticipate continuing to do that over time and continuing to add uh, add more fish, add new species. Um, one of the interesting you know situations we have now is we have so many young fish um, in the tank, and um, uh, you know one of the things we're thinking about is over time, are we going to allow all those just to grow up and be bigger? Or are we going to think about trying to find other homes for them, maybe at other aquariums, and bring in uh, new smaller fish? Um, do we, you know, for all the new species that we brought in, which ones of them seem to be working out well, and which ones seem to be good neighbors, you know, and which ones might we want to find alternatives for? So um, we're really now, now that we've got the tank open, we're really taking a very close look at how all the animals are doing and and. Um, Kind of what we want the collection to look like going forward, but um, absolutely, we're going to be you know you know adding new species, adding more uh, species that are already in the tank um, over time. Um, and when we do these collecting trips, um, you know Chris knows each one has a list 
of fish that we're really trying to collect. You know, it's not just that we go out and collect anything. Um, so it's a pretty intentional process. And I'd like to chime in that uh, we, we have become, because of our renovation and having to take all of the fish out of the tank and then put them back in along with another 1,400 fish or so, we've become quite expert at this, so um, we'll bring it on. <laughs> You're all ready to add new fish, huh? <laughs> Chris, Billy, I want to thank you both for uh, being with us today, answer some questions during this uh, member Google Hangout. Thank you very much, guys. We do want to let pleasure. our members know about this once again. This is a piece of coral that was removed whoop, other way, from the giant ocean tank when we started construction, and it can be yours. We're giving this away to a member. We've had less than, uh, fewer than two dozen of these, all of which were awarded to members through various methods, and this is another example of that. All you need to do is take our survey about today's Hangout, and you'll find that at www.neaq.org slash Hangout Survey. I had trouble reading it. It's actually backwards on my screen. Hangout Survey. If you just take that quick survey, it's about four questions. You'll fill in your member information, and we will um, draw on the name of a winner tomorrow. We'll post that on this same page www.neaq.org slash member hangout and um, we will announce the winner there. Somebody will take this home. We also want to let you know that coming up we have Fish Fun and Fright, our annual Halloween party which will be taking place on October 25th. Tickets for that event go on sale on October 9th so you want to uh, keep an eye out there. If you haven't received your pass, your um, uh, pardon me, postcard for the event. You should be receiving it very soon. But again, tickets will go on sale on October 9th at noon. You can get those online and we will have more information about the event posted very soon. Once again, I'd like to thank Billy and Chris for being with us. Also, thanks to Dan Manchin and Jeff Ives who have been doing the technical end of things for us here. We hope you uh, enjoyed today's Hangout. Please give us your feedback and uh, hopefully we'll do this again real soon. Thank you very much for being with us today. <laughs>